Um, so I want to welcome uh, today's speaker uh, and thank uh, them for joining us. Uh, Katie uh, Acosta, Dr. Acosta, uh, uh, is here with us and has an engaging presentation for us. Uh, Dr. Acosta, it's uh, great having you here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here with all of you today. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Um, um, so I'll do a brief introduction um, of Dr. Costa and her previous works, which if you have not read, I highly recommend, they're highly engaging and, and really uh, um, interesting uh, uh, pieces of, of, of literature on sexuality, gender, et cetera, that I think open up a lot of spaces within, at, at, at least within sociology, for uh, non-conforming uh, identities, individuals, et cetera, and the ways they um, interact with their families, amongst other things. So uh, I'll do a brief introduction, and then uh, we'll let you take uh, the stage, Dr. Acosta. Uh, so Dr. Katie Acosta is an associate professor and director of graduate studies in the Department of Sociology at Georgia State University. Her research centers on the intersections of gender, sexuality, Latinx studies, race, ethnicity, family, and immigration. She's author of Amigas y Amantes, Sexually Non-Conforming Latinas Negotiate Family. Uh, this book explores the ways lesbian, bisexual, and queer Latinas manage relationships with their partners, families of origin, and families of choice. Her second book, Queer Step Families, The Path to Social and Legal Recognition, highlights the complex dynamics that influence lesbian, bisexual, queer, and transgender parent family strength and resilience. Her most recent research, and the one that she'll be talking uh, to us about today, uh, explores the experiences of Central American and Mexican asylum seekers and the ways asylum politics shape race and ethnic ties among various disadvantaged racially minoritized groups in the United States. So it's an honor to have you here, Dr. Acosta. Uh, thank you for coming and sharing your newest work with us. And um, I'll let you have the floor. Thank you so much, Dr. Ortiz. <clears throat> so just give me one moment while I share my screen with you. Okay, you should be able to see my screen now. <clears throat> yes. Okay. So thank you all for having me and welcome. Thank you for spending some of your afternoon with me. Um, what I am sharing today stems from my community activism work in Atlanta with Central American um, and Mexican asylum seekers who have been recently released from ICE detention. After spending a year supporting asylum seekers who were traveling by bus across states in order to reach their sponsors, I decided that I wanted to document um, some of the observations that um, I was witnessing. And <clears throat> I started to work on a project that would allow me to integrate Gloria Ansaldúa's theory of spiritual activism with my own community work. Drawing on my field notes uh, from my time in this community, today I really want to map with you some of the integration um, of spiritual activism and community work and to walk through with you how I developed my identity as a scholar activist. <clears throat> So before her death, Gloria Ansaldúa began developing a theory of spiritual activism, which ties together many of the important concepts that um, she had developed over previous decades. And afterward, after her passing, Ana Luis Keating and a few others have risen to the task of building spiritual activism into a more fully developed theoretical framework for scholars to adopt in their own writing. Ansaldúa notes um, in Now Let Us Shift that individual growth through self-reflection and personal inventory is necessary and it's essential in our efforts to promote transformative change. 
spiritual activism is a powerful form of praxis because it serves as a bridge between one's sense of self and one's material work. Spiritual activism requires one to remain connected to anti-colonialist thinking and to remain open to worlds outside of that material one within which we live. <clears throat> And one must use the spiritual connection to build conocimiento and to allow that knowledge to fuel one's activist work. This practice, Ansaldu argued, um, allows one's activist efforts to be transformative. So in now let us shift, Ansaldua maps the seven stages of conocimiento. And I just wanna go through them briefly here with you all because I refer to them um, as I talk about my work in community. The first is the arrebato, right? This is the violent attack. Um, your sense of security has been brought into question and you are scared. You move from there into Nepantala, right? Where you are living between cultures. You're adrift in a liminal space. From there, you enter this dark place. You are in the pit of your grief. And Saldua describes this place often as like um, finding oneself wrapped in this fetal position, right? Very wounded. But you reach a turning point by step four. When you move toward discomfort, when you embrace the possibilities of change. <clears throat> Here on Saldua notes that something in you must die in order for something else to be reborn. As you engage through these steps, as you move through this process, you move towards developing and forming a new sense of self, using the remnants of the old self to develop a new personal myth. One of the most um, valuable pieces that um, I recall from the first time I read Now Let Us Shift was how Ansaldua described the blow up, where you are caught in the middle of a power struggle. You are in conflict with others, others who are marginalized individuals, as are you. Um, and I want to quote Ansaldua just very briefly here, as she writes in Now Let Us Shift, that we are buying into victimhood, forces you and them to compete for the coveted prize of the walking wounded. It's always stuck with me, this sentence, in this work because it is such a state of what we often do, right? When we're so busy in our own hurt, in our own pain, that we compete with one another for who is more oppressed and who is struggling more um, and who needs to be heard the loudest and not thinking beyond ourselves um, as individuals to adapting and connecting to our bridges and connecting and finding our common places. And Ansadua left us with hope and now let us shift. Because with shifting realities, we see that Nepantleras are coming together. They come together to find common ground. And conocimiento helps us all move past our pain and move toward the table. These steps are essential for all of us in moving to a place where we learn to adopt spiritual activism. Um, and in the work that I want to talk about today, I... Um, I come back to this framework often because um, in the years that it's taken me to build this work, uh, this particular model, these stages have been my guide. So I need to start today by taking you back to 2016 because the 2016 election was the arrebato that started this work for me. <clears throat> Trump had been elected into office and the vitriol against quote unquote illegals had grown to levels that many could never have imagined. And it was during this time that we saw ICE agents begin separating families who were seeking asylum and putting children in cages. We also saw an increase in ICE rates during these years. On August 7th, 2019, ICE conducted the largest raid in one state that this country had ever seen. 
almost 700 people were arrested in Mississippi on that day. And when school let out that afternoon, hundreds of children across multiple elementary schools had no one to pick them up. All of their parents had been arrested. The instances that occurred <clears throat> in 2016 and soon thereafter galvanized the country in support of migrant rights. U.S. citizens watched the reports of these ICE raids and um, how the conditions under which asylum seekers were being held. People watched those things in horror, no longer able to recognize their own country's morals. And at the center of this controversy have been individual actors, individual actors who resist their dehumanization and their criminalization by presenting a counter narrative of themselves as family members. And I noticed this early on, even before I started doing work in this community, in terms of how um, ice raids and asylum seekers were being presented on television. I saw and focused on how much um, we heard about the children who were being separated from parents. <clears throat> I'm reminded here and want to remind all of you that our existing U.S. immigration system was built and founded upon this notion of family reunification. And in the middle of that, what we've seen over the past few years has been this shift between presenting migrants as family members and as victims while simultaneously combating this vitriol, this notion of these migrants as rapists, as criminals, as drug dealers and addicts, and as gang members. <clears throat> I must take you to my field site. And since I am actually showing my first picture here, um, I want to make clear to all of you that the pictures that I share in this presentation were not taken by me. These are all pictures that are um, easily available on the internet. I have selected pictures that are publicly available that look and resemble many of the sites that I have seen um, and experienced so that you all have an understanding of how that process, what that process looks like, but I did not take any pictures. And we can talk about that later if people would like to. The field site. So after my after 2016, I moved seamlessly into Nepantla and in this liminal space where I am an academic um, who is expected to conduct research, to mentor graduate students, to engage in service, but where I as a person am also desperately needing my community and I'm needing it for my own individual healing. And that space my own position in Nepantala is what brought me to the field site. Before the pandemic, I would travel twice a week to a bus station in downtown Atlanta to meet asylees that were coming in from McAllen, Texas. Most of the families that I worked with had small children and they were almost always heading north to DC, Maryland, Virginia, Philadelphia, and New York City. I did this work alongside other volunteers, <clears throat> all part of a grass, grassroots group of volunteers that wanted to support migrants on their journeys to help them reach their sponsors in the most comfortable way possible. The task was really quite simple, to translate for them, to help them get on their connecting buses to offer them food and water. Some wanted to know what city they were in, um, where they could catch the next bus, how many more times they would have to transfer buses before arriving at their final destination. Some have asked me if they could call their sponsors to update their loved ones about their progress. 
some asked that I explain the confusing rules that existed at the bus station. They wanted to <clears throat> know why their buses had been delayed and could they be redirected on another bus? And how would the latest delay affect their arrival time? Their questions were endless, to be honest, but so were their physical needs. The travelers were completely exhausted. They were thirsty. Some children were dehydrated as they had been stuck on buses where they became motion sick. <clears throat> they needed clean clothes, shoes, diapers, feminine hygiene products. In the three years that I have spent volunteering to help asylum seekers at bus stations, more than anything else, what I find that um, these migrants need is a friendly face that they feel they can trust. One who will not try to take advantage of them or admonish them or criminalize them for seeking asylum in the United States. <clears throat> when I've seen and met folks um, at these bus stations, they are maybe 24 to 48 hours out of having been released from ICE detention. Um, since these migrants have come from McAllen, they've been released um, and a, oftentimes to a charity organization um, in the McAllen, Texas area where they um, can receive a uh, change of clothes um, and where they can receive help in getting their, their, their bus tickets. And then they are on buses. Um, often for days in order to get to their destination. We've estimated that about 60% of the traffic coming from McAllen lands in Atlanta at some point on this journey. And through communications, um, through social media, through texting and WhatsApp, um, <clears throat> groups along the way from Texas to Atlanta, um, volunteers, at each stop along the way, let the next group know who's coming, how many people, who to be prepared for. When it works well, that's what happens. In Atlanta, we had a particularly unique situation because the migrants were arriving um, at a bus station that's located in the middle of downtown Atlanta, where we have some of the largest unhoused populations in the city. <clears throat> Atlanta has been particularly cruel, I would argue, to their unhoused populations. Um, we've closed some of our biggest and most essential homeless shelters, which has made it very difficult for folks to rebound and find places that they can be safe. We've also set up city ordinances that um, prohibit everyday folks from being able to set up food stations to feed people who live on the streets. Um, one of the results has been that many unhoused individuals have set up um, tents very, very close to the downtown bus station. And so on any given day, when I'm out at the station um, to support asylum seekers, I am also out there in the same space um, as the tents and sleeping bags that the unhoused have set up for themselves. We tend to share this space. So some of what I will go over with you all today is directly related to my experience with the asylum seekers and some of it is directly related to my experiences with the unhoused and the ways that they interact with each other and the ways that they interact with me. You may be wondering about the images on this slide. When asylum seekers board buses in McAllen, <clears throat> volunteers give them a folder, similar to the one that's pictured here on the left. So they get a folder that looks like this. Inside that folder is their bus ticket and their sponsor's phone numbers. Their folders say, please help me. 
in Atlanta, I would carry this folder or something similar. Si no muestra su sobre marrón, te podemos ayudar. This folder marked me as someone there to help asylum seekers. So if I hold up the folder while I stand outside waiting for a bus, the migrants can see my folder and I can see their folder. When our folders see each other, basically, <clears throat> I usually will break the awkward silence and speak. I introduce myself. I offer help. There's a lot that I can say about the past couple of years that I've spent doing this work. Um, but mostly what I want to do is focus on three sets of observations. Um, and hopefully later when we do a bit of Q&A, you all can give me your thoughts on this as well. The three observations that I want to focus on, um, the first is about agents of social control and parallel transience. The agents of social control that I am referring to here are the security guards, the police officers, the TSA agents in these spaces. And the parallel transience that I described is about the observations I watched, observations of unhoused individuals who live on tents in Atlanta and migrants, asylum seekers who are lost and waiting for their next direction. The second observation is about presenting oneself as family. And here I'm looking at um, the strategic ways that asylum seekers resist being uh, pr uh, presented as carceral subjects, sometimes despite having ankle bracelets and always while having clear instructions and orders of what their next thing that they're supposed to do is to avoid problems with TSA. And the third piece that I want to talk about is what I'm calling the body speaks. And this piece is really about how my presence in this space <clears throat> as someone who physically looks like me, an Afro-Latina individual with phenotypically African features and a woman of Latin American descent who speaks Spanish fluently in this space creates a bit of dissonance for both of the groups that I describe here in section one. So let me get into it so that I can explain. <clears throat> it's not uncommon for me to observe ICE officials standing outside of bus terminals awaiting um, to board newly arrived buses as passengers um, asking passengers for their documentation at random. I saw it pretty often. Because the passengers are all newly released from detention, the random checks that they experience between the border and their final destination city occurs within days of their release. These migrants often arrive in Atlanta with their ankle bracelets, <clears throat> similar to those that are born by prison inmates who are newly released from prison and who are on parole. These efforts, of course, weave this um, web of surveillance for which asylum seekers are constantly subject. It's not uncommon for me to witness the Atlanta police officers and ICE agents standing side by side at bus terminals awaiting passengers, the latter only distinguishable by a black vest that they wear with ice written in bold white lettering. Presumably, the Atlanta Police Department is only present, is only, presumably the only reason that they're there is to manage the everyday street crime occurring in the area 
but it's unclear nonetheless in these scenarios where one's authority ends and when the other's authority begins. Still, it's an important distinction because one of these agents of social control has the capacity to deport the asylum seekers and the other does not. To the migrants, of course, there is no distinction. They're terrified of all of them. Because I met families outside, I would regularly interact with the homeless population who were also out there, mostly African-American men. <clears throat> I observed how this homeless population was treated by transit officials and by the Atlanta Police Department. And then I started to juxtapose that treatment with that of the mostly Central American or Mexican migrants who are newly arrived in the same space. Once, while outside, I noticed APD restraining an African-American homeless man with a cognitive impairment. The homeless man was scared. He was slurring his words, and he had a difficult time holding up his own body. He kept asking them to leave him alone. And APD was insisting that he get on the ground in the middle of the street. He didn't seem to understand the request that they were making. And APD was getting more and more frustrated. They pushed the man onto the floor and left him with his cheek kissing the street. One officer had a knee on the man's back. The man cried, leave me alone. Upset, a fellow volunteer who was working with me that night yelled at the officers. Leave him alone, she said. He isn't bothering anybody. Shut the fuck up, lady, the APD officer said. Mind your own business. This is my business, the volunteer screamed back. Do you have a permit for that food stand? The officer asked her. Hearing this, I ran over and grabbed the volunteer. We aren't selling anything, I assured the officer as I pulled the volunteer away. Do you have a permit for that table? The officer asked again. I looked down at the floor. Okay then, he said, mind your business. This interaction bothered me for the rest of the night. As a volunteer, my purpose there was to help the asylum seekers. But on that particular night, this homeless man needed somebody to help. And I of course felt powerless to do anything about it. My powerlessness, of course, is stemming in part from the fact that, technically speaking, I didn't have a right to set up a distribution table on that public street corner because of Atlanta's legislation against um, setting up tables to feed the homeless. Every time that I went out to work at the bus stations, I certainly ran the risk of getting fined for having a table that I didn't have a permit for. The volunteers and I were clear though, we really didn't care about that. We were willing to absorb that risk. We knew that if we didn't draw attention to ourselves, no one would bother us. On this night, of course, advocating for the homeless man meant that we were risking shutting down the volunteer work. Parallel transience for me stems from watching experiences like this and thinking through what it means for the unhoused individuals who are being surveilled um, on these street corners and the um, migrants who sometimes are watching this chaos happen with their own fears and their own baggage from their own treatments and detention standing in front of them and holding them there in a paralyzed way.
So standing out there at those tables gave me the opportunity to see how asylees responded to the unhoused population and vice versa. And this got me thinking about racial tensions and interethnic conflict between these two groups. When our operations and the volunteer work that we were doing were moved outside, <clears throat> when we had to set up tables outside, that we got more and more requests from the unhoused people for the supplies that we were um, carrying on any given day for the migrants. And we never knew how many migrants were going to come. So we never knew if we had enough supplies or if we had an excess of supplies and if there was enough supplies to share. What we knew on any given day was that there was more than enough need. And so we constantly struggled with the unhoused individuals who would say, can I have a bottle of water? And we would say, how many bottles of water did we bring? How many can we give out before the bus shows up with the migrants? And how many are we going to need for the migrants? We had a lot of requests from homeless people, and this was really hard. I wrote about it in my field notes one night when I left the site. And I'm just going to read you a small excerpt of that. One man told me that we were being racist because we were only serving Latinx people. He also expressed his particular unhappiness with me because in his words, as a black person, I should wanna help him. I have a lot of thoughts on this issue, most too complicated to articulate here. But what I will say is that I think our efforts may be contributing to the unintended effect of worsening race relations between marginalized groups. I wrote this after leaving a field site on a particularly difficult night where despite the volunteers' best efforts, we ran out of supplies. Concerned about the racial tensions that I, exper that I experienced and that I watched take place um, between migrants and the unhoused, <clears throat> I put a lot of effort into explaining to the unhoused who the asylum seekers are and why we had spent, why we had been sent there to do the work that we were doing. Most of these individuals had no idea um, what asylum was nor why we were experiencing the influx of migrants, um, now more so than we had at other times. But regardless, the interactions revealed their resentment, which stems from feelings that their needs are being neglected while those of asylum seekers are being met. Part of what I do with this work in journeying asylum seekers is in trying to draw parallels between these two communities who are both criminalized through similar agents of social control, but who do not see any real affinity with one another. I'm trying to explore the inter-ethnic conflict as stemming from resentment in times of sparse resources. But I also am exploring how this conflict stems from larger systems of racial oppression that pit one racially minoritized group against another, both trying to claim their stake as more deserving based on the same racist and gendered logic that's used to oppress them in the first place. I am reminded here of Ansaldua and of the work that Ansaldua did in developing the seven stages of conocimiento. Because as you recall, <clears throat> when I began, Ansaldua warned that when we fight for the status of victimhood, we are fighting to be seen as the wounded. I'm reminded of that every time I'm at the station.
The next piece I want to talk about is presenting as family. U.S. immigration policies have evolved, right? They've evolved from a system that was primarily focused on family reunification to one that's engaged in this process of criminalizing migrants and placing them in, the, in opposition to hardworking American citizens, quote unquote. The racialized undertones that evoked in this political framing of migrants as nefarious individuals who are opposed to family members not only divide people into good and bad individuals, but they're divided into worthy individuals and non-citizens. At the center of this entire controversy are these individual actors. And what I saw more than anything among these actors is the ways in which they resist allowing others to dehumanize them by presenting a counter narrative of themselves as family members. <clears throat> I saw individuals present themselves as family members as a strategy repeatedly. For example, when two parent families seeking asylum separate themselves into individual groups of single parents, they are facilitating their reading by border enforcement as a family, as vulnerable subjects. I noticed this almost immediately when starting the work that I did in community because of the number of fathers that I saw. Fathers engaging in this act of presenting themselves as family in order to counteract the view of themselves as terrorists, as criminals and as gang members. One of my earliest observations doing this work <clears throat> was of these fathers. When families would split up, fathers would take one child and mothers would take another. And the result was fathers with infants in arms changing a diaper in a chair inside a bus station, or struggling to hold a baby in one arm while holding bus tickets that needed to be reissued in another arm. I regularly found myself as a volunteer, um, offering toddlers toys and crayons to keep them busy, or bouncing a baby on my hip to give a migrant parent's arms a rest. I lost my wife, one dad told me in Spanish. My parents, my sister, my wife, and three kids, we all came walking together, but we got separated and I haven't been able to find them. He looked at me, bewildered. I boarded a bus with this man, still holding his baby, while he walked, while he looked, walked up and down the aisles of the bus, looking for an empty seat among all of the passengers. As he reached to put his backpack into a compartment on the bus, he pulled out <clears throat> a bag with identifying, identifying documents inside. This is me, he said, showing me a photo ID. This is who I am. I looked at his documents politely, but I hesitated in reading the name. It is always better that I don't have any personal information for these passengers. It was only later, thinking back on this incident, that I realized that he wanted me to remember his information. He wanted me to remember his information in case I happened to meet his family at this bus station in the days or weeks to come. Only later did I realize that he was hoping I might be able to convey to his family that he had crossed the border, that I had met him in Atlanta, and that they were almost safe.
I have one more piece I'd like to share with you all today before I move back to talking about what this means for scholar activism. And this line of research is focused on what I'm calling the body speaks. The asylum seekers in the unhoused who live near the station, <clears throat> often how they interact with me is illustrative of their interest in connection and also in distance. The mostly African-American black unhoused individuals want to accentuate my blackness as a way of creating that common thread. I'm reminding, he reminded here of the person who stopped me wanting the water bottle, who said, as a black person, you should want to help me. This homeless person wanted to accentuate my blackness in the interest of creating that common thread, but it is that very aspect of my identity that is most often erased when I interact with asylum seekers in this same space. Oftentimes, these migrants will say, ¿Y tú de dónde eres? And I will reply, yo soy de la República Dominicana. ¿Y a dónde es eso? One Honduran woman would said to me once. I had a phenotypically white Salvadoran individual um, who I ended up speaking with for a long period of time at the station while he waited his connecting bus. We talked about our families and he asked to see a picture of my daughter. And I shared one with him. And in looking at my daughter's picture, he um, noted her features, her physical features, um, and the extent to which her mixed race features favored more her Anglo ancestry than mine. In doing so, he said, Tu no eres negra, pero I, of course, he says, am not black, but. The rest of that statement was about my daughter and how her features embodied whiteness in a way that mine's did not. These uh, little comment call out bubbles that I have here are um, indicative of the kinds of call outs that go on in my head all the time when I see these kinds of reactions from people. I approach it with a sense of curiosity and fascination um, because as a sociologist, of course, that part of me doesn't ever turn off. And so I'm really interested in how people think about this stuff, how they think about someone who's out there, um, you know, intending no harm to anybody, but someone who one might not be certain they want to consider a friend or that they could trust to be a friend. And the ways in which people think about race, ethnicity, and culture in this space and articulate some of those thoughts out loud to me in an unfiltered way is something that I find very fascinating particularly because we are talking about groups where there is so much parallel transience. I wanna shift here to thinking through about my position as a scholar activist. Being a scholar activist has afforded me the opportunity to reflect upon how theory fuels my community work. For me, being a scholar activist means that <clears throat> my work as an academic involves blending my research activities with my community engagement. They're not separate. They're intertwined practices that are informed by my intersectional feminist paradigms. My community engagement in a space that affords me the opportunity to be surrounded by co-ethnics, to speak Spanish, and to continue the lifelong practice of immigrant advocacy that has been a signature facet of my entire life and that of many children of immigrants. That work is important to me. Um, and in this way, the work that I do with asylum seekers 
tethers me to who I am as a person, separate from the academy and from the infinite ways that academia has tried to define me. My community work with asylum seekers protects me from losing sight of what matters most to me, an Afro-Latina, a feminist scholar, a daughter of immigrants, and all of these identities in no particular order. It tethers me to who I am and it becomes and is what I do. Every day as an educator and as a researcher, as a community advocate, day in and day out, I contribute to the creation of this nurturing space of resistance. Sometimes people think when I talk about the volunteer work that I do, they think about what I do for others as if offering someone water is in some way a saintly act. I don't see it that way at all, right? I get far more out of this experience than any small kindness that I can offer someone on any given day. This is about creating spaces of resistance for myself in a very whitewashed academic environment. And hanging on to that space and that version of my identity, remaining tethered to it within an academic world that constantly tries to redefine me to fit its mold. And this is where spiritual activism guides me. I turn to it again and again, because I think scholars can learn from Ansan Lewis' theory of spiritual activism as a grounding force in our efforts to produce social justice and anti-racist centered scholarship. I think that this is possible because spiritual activism is a form of praxis. And going back to it at this point in my life as a scholar who is tenured and who is in a position to take risks, I'm able to find ways to bridge together the academic work that I do with the activist work that I do and to see them as connected when at times in earlier iterations of my life, of my academic life, I wasn't allowed to. Ansaldua's theories are consistently focused on bridges, creating them to create the worlds and building them to connect us. Scholar activists who choose to advance their scholarship must challenge the bifurcation of this fundamental aspects of our identities in the academy. And we must also demand of ourselves and of our students to work on creating those bridges and to fight those divisions. We need to expect the personal passion that ignites and fuels spiritual activism to come out in our writing, right? It is an injustice to our social causes for these aspects of our identities to remain separate from how we write for academic journals. For our abilities to advance knowledge requires that we connect with the personal, for it is ultimately she who brings us all to the activism in the first place. And as all of our feminist theory has taught us over the years, we know that it is that work, right, that is and fuels production of knowledge. <clears throat> so I'd like to end here today. Thank all of you for um, listening. I'm going to stop sharing so that I can open the floor for your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Director Acosta. This was a terrific presentation and um, gave me a lot to think about and a lot to learn. Um, please, um, uh, we have a few questions already. I want to remind you, since I didn't do it at the beginning of the session, to use the Q&A button to, uh, on the bottom of your Zoom to ask 
any questions that you might want to post to Dr. Acosta. Um, in the meantime, I'll, I'll begin with a couple of questions. Um, Laura Ramirez asks, uh, did you encounter a language barrier communicating with the migrants as English slash Spanish was assumed? So I often started with speaking Spanish to folks, and I definitely encountered certain migrants who spoke an indigenous language that I could not understand. Um, and while that was difficult, we tended to figure out how to make do with basic communication, in part because so many of the individuals that I encountered had their children, presenting as family was part of the strategy. And I found that even if parents were primarily speaking an indigenous language, the children had more knowledge or more background with Spanish that I could ask and speak to, you know, five or six year old children, and they would help to create that bridge. <clears throat> so yes, that's where I found the biggest problem um, with, with these migrants. And it, it wasn't constant but it, it happened enough that I had to kind of get creative. Yeah, that, that, that makes perfect sense. Um, you know, um, this is not a question, but Taryn Price uh, says, that was very moving, Dr. Acosta, thank you so much. So I just wanted to pass that along. Thank you. Um, you know, one thing that, um, before I ask the couple, next couple of questions, that that really strikes me is how much how interesting it is that this particular experiences kind of confront you abruptly face to face with the with the ways in which we use in society identities and that we use those identities to especially marginalized identities to, to, to try to either convince people of our points or make those people that are already marginalized kind of have to fight for resources. Um, that was very, very impressive. So I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about those experiences. Those must have been not only jarring, but um, perhaps not not eye opening because, of course, you have probably experienced this as I as I have as an as a as a, you know an uh, an immigrant that's Mexican but at the same time phenotypically white male. So so you know these kinds of things tend to happen. Um, but could you ex can you talk a little bit more about those issues? Yeah, it was frustrating because so much of what we were experiencing in doing this work at the stations was around not having enough resources to just give them to everyone, but also knowing that we had established and mobilized a large network where the resources were coming from. And we could potentially have enough to provide for everyone, but we had to never have more than we could carry, more than we could easily shut down and leave with if police came and asked about the damn table. And so we were in this position where the scarcity mentality that was creating the hostility and the anger and the resentment was entirely avoidable because while we may not have had enough water bottles or enough of, of lunch kits for people on site, we did have more and we knew we had more in a storage unit. We knew that we, would, that we had more that we didn't bring with us because of the problem of needing to very quickly pack up and set up and set out. And this is why, like, I always go back to this notion of, you know, these larger bureaucratic structures that create these agents and systems of social control that then pit people against each other in entire, in unnecessary ways. I'm not saying that this would have been replicable at some large scale, but for what we were doing and considering how often we were out there, we knew how many 
unhoused folks we would encounter on any given day. We knew who they were. They, they came to expect us and to know we were coming. And so it was frustrating to be in a position where we weren't, where the tension that was being created and the like pitting of one group against another was to some degree avoidable. Um, it also was really interesting to see the ways in which migrants who described all sorts of awful experiences with, um, with when they were in ICE detention, being shamed, you know, being being chastised. Um, women described that they were yelled at for being pregnant and how they were told by border agents that their pregnancies, that they were coming here so they could have their kids and make their children be the U.S.'s responsibility. I mean, they they described the shaming of their own status as family members. They described the shaming of the choices um, that they had quote unquote made, right? So border agents would um, argue with them of like, oh, you're saying you wanna to come to the US because you feel unsafe because your, your children's father is, is a gang member and someone's looking for him. What made you choose a gang member to have a child with that kind of logic? The, the shaming that people described experiencing in that way in itself, to me, as an outsider looking in, felt so similar to the kind of shaming that the unhoused were experiencing when, for instance, the, this person's cheek is literally on the sidewalk. I still don't know what that man did. I never understood what he did wrong I, or how that situation went so south so quickly. And so I could see it. And I found it fascinating that these groups were so caught up in their own individual pain that it was difficult to move towards seeing what was happening for another group. So, but I had yeah. the privilege of standing outside of it. So, you know, it, it made it so that I, it was easier for me to see that. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll, we have so many questions, so I'm just gonna try to, to feel them all. Isabel Latz, um, says, thank you so much, Dr. Acosta, for your critical work. Uh, over 4 million Ukrainians had to flee their country since the beginning of the war. Thankfully, other EU countries and the US are overwhelmingly as, and accepting and supportive of them. Could this terrible moment in history of grave human suffering somehow create an opportunity for the US to rethink their treatment of refugees slash asylum seekers from across our southern border? So it's been, it's a great question. And it's been an interesting time for me to process what's happened in Ukraine over the past month and a half. Um, because, you know, for so long, the quote unquote migration crisis has focused on the US-Mexico border, right? The focus has been on people that are coming from Central America and particularly that US-Mexico border. That's where we've seen the quote unquote problem. And for most of the years that I was doing this work, we were under this Trump administration where the, pro where the focus was not on humanitarianism, not on compassion, not on support. It was this, this logic of, keep them out. We have no space for them. We don't want them here, right? They're a problem. They're seen as a burden. And watching what's happened with Ukraine and the ways in which people have fled in droves and watching the ways in which other countries have opened their doors says a lot um, about the racialized undertones and how we see migrant experiences. <clears throat> how who we see as a migrant who is deserving of humanity versus those who are not and then the ways in which we create policies to further support exactly that vision right so asylum for instance um is 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 set up to better support someone who is leaving a country that is in the middle of an active war with another country, 
but a war that's happening on the ground between police and drug cartels isn't considered a war. And therefore, there's less sympathy for that particular migrant group. But their people are dying around them in both spaces, right? Like, I can't tell you how many migrants have told me about some watching someone die, having a family member killed in front of them, be leaving because they're afraid because someone has attempted to kill them or one of their children, right? They're also fleeing bloodshed, but that's not considered a war. And that's largely based on this largely racialized notion and very politicized notion of who is the deserving and not deserving migrant. So. Yeah, I've, uh, you know, I've, I've been myself thinking exactly the same things while I see this unfold. And, uh, and I think you're 100% on the mark. Um, Adriana Gamboa asks, how did work, and you, you told us a little bit about this already. So if you want to expand a, a little bit on how did you, working with the asylum and on house affect your, affect you emotionally? So, you know, I, I don't have a final answer for this. Um, I have a hard time getting through this talk without getting upset. Um, and, it's, you know, and this is just a small piece of it. Um, it's very emotional work. It was incredibly hard. I definitely have had to go through periods where I take times away from it, where, you know, I, I can't go for a couple of weeks and I just, I need, I need a minute, right, to recuperate from something that's happened. Um, there is a way in which these families stay with you. Um, and I really worked hard not to know their names. Um, I really tried to not have any information with me that could potentially jeopardize them, right, in any way. Um, but I oftentimes would call a sponsor and say, I just helped your person get on this bus. This is the time they're coming. You know, they don't have a way to communicate with you, but this is what you can expect. And I dealt with people calling me because my number was the last time they heard from their loved one. They would call me if their loved one didn't arrive. And so there's this way in which being at the bus station and then leaving, leaving those streets and going back to the rest of my life in my office in the ivory tower was wildly just it was that in itself has always been very difficult for me, but always knowing that I'm never far away from what I just experienced, that a phone call will come in and someone will say, you know, they didn't make it. Do you have any information? Do you know anyone I can call? What, what could I possibly do? Um, it means that I never stop thinking about these people. Um, and so it is really emotionally difficult work. Um, but even with that, you know, I, I need to say that I still get more out of the experience than not, and I absolutely get more out of the experience than any of them do, because it reminds me what, of what matters, right? It reminds me when I go back to my R1 institution and when I'm sitting here being expected to do X, Y, or Z, it reminds me how small that is in the grand scheme of life. Um, and sometimes when you are in the world of an academic, you know, for me at least, I need to have that check all the time because so much around the life that I live as an academic is devoid of the people, right? It's a big, I mean, it's, it's my biggest critique of the academy itself. So much of it is really just devoid of the everyday people on the ground. And so I need that connection. It makes perfect sense. Um, and we both wished, and we were talking about this earlier, how we would hope that academia would value this kind of work much more. And hopefully, even if, you know, 
several of us should hopefully keep working on this and, and at some point this will change. Yeah. Um, um, uh, Ileana Viscara asks, hello, thank you for your time and moving presentation. I am a government and journalism major. So I am hoping that you can speak more to why you did not take pictures. I think journalist, in journalism, I struggle between wanting to document the world around me yet feeling that it's exploitive. Yeah, no, great question. Um, I didn't, I chose not to take pictures because I didn't feel like it would further my goal of getting the migrants to trust me. Um, and other volunteers made different choices. Plenty of people took pictures, took, you know, there was, there were times when people would show up off of a bus and they would have a brand new baby that was days old and volunteers would get so excited, you know, was the baby born in the US was always the first question. Like, did you make it across the border before the baby was born? It was always the first question. And people would be overjoyed by the experience and would, would be very happy for the new parent um, and be happy for this, you know, tiny, tiny human. Um, and they would take pictures and they would wanna share with, the, with other volunteers in our group. I didn't, I just, I made the different choice because for me, it felt like if I wanted them to trust, I needed them to know that I, I didn't want anything from them. Um, I needed them to not feel like, you know, like I was going to take their images and put them on Facebook or let them leak to some place where they wouldn't have control over them. Um, but I also knew that I could afford to not take pictures because I know that there are so many journalist images of these. I mean, any the images I showed you, I could have taken any one of those pictures. They're identical to what I saw at the station all the time, right? Um, they look so much like what I experienced. And so I, I, because at some level we have to have the images, it helps to create the picture for those who are not there. Um, and so you kind of have to balance both of those pieces. And I think it's appropriate for journalists to do that. Um, I don't personally have a problem with journalists doing it. I was concerned that in my case, it would be easier if I just focused on being present and connecting with them and knowing full well that I would write field notes later and that those field notes would include, you know, descriptions of the scars that they would show me on their bodies or, you know, the graphic details that they would share with me about their survival. Um, and that was enough for me. Thank you so much. Um, Eileen Van Vee asks, this was a powerful presentation. What police policies exist in Atlanta to make officers accountable for their actions and the safety of the people? Um, so I don't think that there are many that um, policy wise, I do know of some great organizations, nonprofit legal aid work that are doing nonprofit legal aid work to support um, individuals who have been on the receiving end of undue surveillance. But it really is like, it's a hard, it's a hard line. Um, the abuse of power that I experienced as someone with all of the privilege of US citizenship someone who speaks fluent English, who has a PhD, and the violence and the overreach of power that I experienced just being in the vicinity of these transient folks is telling, right? It says something, you know, when, when, when these police officers are saying, shut the fuck up, lady, to someone who's like expressing concern, um, it, it says something about like, that's what 
I'm getting with all the privilege that I have, then what can I possibly expect for these folks? And the unfortunate thing is that while there are, I think, some good organizations in the Atlanta area that are trying to do work to support these individuals and also doing work with um, uh, police alternative programs, um, to create, you know, an, an option for folks who need assistance other than calling the police. I've seen some great work happening in that area, in the Atlanta area. Um, but it's, it's, it's still few and far between, and so it's, it's limited. Um, like, we need a lot more of it, a lot more. Um. Uh, Neil, I'm trying to to get through. Uh, uh, we might need to go a little bit over to cover all of the of the questions. If, if you do have the time, I don't want to impose Dr. Acosta. If you don't, just let me know, and, and I'll I'll ask as many as I can. <laughs> yeah, I can go ahead a bit longer. Go ahead. Thank you, um, Neil Harvey. Asks, Thank you, Dr. Acosta. Do you involve your students in your work? If so, what do they gain from such experience? So I've tried only once to involve students in the work. Um, I would really like to. Um, I, I've tried once with one student um, and I think that emotionally it was just not, not, it's just hard. It's just, it, it can be really hard. And I'm not yet well trained in how to support my students for what they see. I also don't know what they're what they'll see because I never know day to day how bad it will be. Some days are very very routine out there. You know, you 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 make things happen and people leave and and they have smiles on their faces and and you feel like you you know the work's been done. And then other days I'm there and I, I can't detach myself from the severity of what's going on. Um, so it's hard to train people for that. I wish I had more support at an institutional level to be able to develop a robust program around supporting students in doing this work, something that came alongside preparation going into the field and emotional support coming out. Um, I can dream that, you know, that, that something like this could be developed at some point, but I definitely don't have it yet. Yeah, this goes back to the, the institutional, so hopefully, support that academia should have for these kinds of projects. Um, um, Marshall Taylor asks, a question from an undergraduate sociological theory class that's in attendance. Are there any core pieces of advice you would give to up-and-coming sociologists interested in scholar activism? What are some of the challenges? So, yeah, great question. You know, I didn't, like comfortably utter the word scholar activist to define myself until I had tenure. And that's not okay. You know, it's, it's not okay. And it's a structural issue within academia that really needs to change. And sociologists in particular should know better. Um, we really should know better. We really should know to value the community engagement to build it into people's performance evaluations so that it's not something that they do in a closeted way, but something that they own as part of who they are. Um, and for me, moving through the stages of conocimiento is about getting to a place where I'm accepting this as part of my identity at this point, that I can state unapologetically, irrespective of whether or not it makes an academic or a dean uncomfortable, whether or not they understand it, whether or not they see it as directly translatable into a book contract or a journal article. I don't care whether or not that's the case, but I don't care anymore because my job doesn't depend on their approval in that same way anymore. That was not the case for me, um, you know, just a few short years ago. And that's the reality of the current limitations in the academy that, you know, I would like to see evolve. Yeah, I, I hope so too. Um, Rachel Coulthard asks, often in these discussions of marginalized people, 
the conversation gravitates towards who is allowed to speak on these issues and the burden to advocate usually falls on people of color. As a woman of color, how have you managed the emotional labor that you put into this research and how do you manage to balance academia and activism? <laughs> That's a million dollar question there. That's a million dollar question right there. Um, so I actually, one thing that I, I started to do about a year into doing this work, um, I was just I was just going and I, I didn't have a real plan for what this would mean. I just knew that I wanted to do it. And so I just kept going. And so I kept supplies in my car. And every time I had time, I would go. I would show up at the bus station two hours before coming into the office in the mornings because I knew that there was a bus that would arrive at the, at, at the, at the station at 7.30. And so I would say, I'm going to go at 7.30 a.m. and I can meet this bus and then I can go to the office, right? I, I, I would do things like that, thinking that this was some kind of like appointment that I could fit into my academic work life. And then it, it became very clear that, that that really was not the approach that, to take for this. But that's how it started for me. And it actually, I have to give a lot of credit to my feminist mentors throughout the country, many of whom are white women, who I shared pieces of this work with and who said, Katie, you need to document this. You need to sit down and write. I don't know what you're going to do with it, but you need to put it down. You need to put it down on paper somewhere. And, you know, that brought me to the place of thinking about making field notes. And the field notes became in tandem to essentially diary entries, journal entries. There's so much that I've written in these notes that's really about how emotionally gutted I was after a specific day or how I dreamt about a specific person that night. It, you know, it became more than just field notes. It became its own form of healing for me. And at first, because I'm a trained academic, I kept these two separate documents where there was field notes in one side and there were these, you know, like emotional processing entries in another. And I kept them separate because that's how academics think. And then I said, why? Right. This is all part of the scholar activist enterprise. This is messy. And I need to just own that and let it let it be like it doesn't have to be this cookie cutter model of academic work that we're used to. Um, I needed to kind of go through the process to give myself the permission to do that. So That's wonderful. And I think that's what, you know, I, I don't know what your plans are still, but I would see this as a, as a wonderful book in exploring not only the myriads of things that are happening here, but also new ways of doing academia that we need to encourage. So um, I, I really am hoping that and I hope I can see the book and read it soon. Um, uh, Kat Jeanette asks, thank you so much for sharing your important work and your uh, vital experiences with us here today. Do you have any suggestions on how to better vocalize support in the academy for expanded research frameworks that center people that center people identity and difference? What would you like to hear in a conversation that would counter resistance, both micro and macro, to this work? Yeah, super great question. Um, <clears throat> so I think we need to start as professors, particularly those of us who are associate in full, need to start doing more of the work of getting at the table with our deans when promotion and tenure manuals are being created and revised. And, you know, start doing the work of uh, gently nudging in the direction of adding community engagement as an explicit bullet point as a form of, of uh, you know, production, right? The way that we look at and talk about books and the way that we look at and talk about journal articles, the ways in which for dance departments, we look at choreographies as a form of, of uh, you know, a collection of their work, right? A community activist project itself needs to be looked at as a culmination of our work, right? Or as a step in that culmination of our work. Um, 
And I have seen like in some departments that department chairs have been able to successfully work on their own departmental promotion and tenure guidelines to add um, scholar activist work um, to, to their, their list of acceptable forms of production. Um, and so I'd like to see more of that happening in departments throughout the country, but I also like these things need to happen within our colleges too, so that it's not just, you know, the Latin American studies program or the Latinx studies program that's doing it, but so that it's actually happening at the college level to give us that additional protection. Yeah, 100% agree. Uh, Catherine Pickering asks, uh, First of all, thank you so much for this talk. I was wondering if you think your research would have policy implications. Uh, for example, could you go on to inform policing in this area? Is that something you would even want from your research? So, I mean, so I've had a similar question posed to me before and I've really had to think about it. Like what policy implications do I want to for something like this like where would I want to emphasize policy work if I were going to do it and I think what I can say is I want the policing and the revising of police departments police reform to be the work of critical criminologists I want critical crim folks to work with police academies on training they're way better equipped to handle that than I am um, and to be honest with you, I don't want to work with cops. I just don't. Um, so there's that. But I do want to have larger conversations around ICE as an authority figure, around border agents and the ways in which they abuse power and how they're being trained to do so. Because some of the things that I've witnessed firsthand and many of the things that I've heard from migrants show are just like clear examples of the, just the overreach, right? The overreach in the name of what I don't know. Um, and, you know, if we were at a point in this country where we were wanting to take an honest and serious look at immigration reform, and we wanted to think about ways in which we can amend our asylum system as a whole, I'd really want to be part of a conversation about what the role of border agents are. What, what exactly, you know, why are we seeing them as an additional layer of surveillance um, as police officers, as trained guards? To what end is the question for me? Yeah, as, as units that can use force, which, yes. which in, in, to, to be honest, in, in, in immigration uh, uh, matters and in asylum matters, it's, it's not needed. Maybe in other matters it might be, but um, I, I want to close the commenting section of, of the presentation since we've taken a lot of your time with, a, with an actual comment. It's not a question, but um, just so that you could see the impact that disseminating this, this work can do. Ryan Martin says, thank you, Dr. Acosta, for your heartfelt world work, particularly in the form of scholarly activism. As a graduate student, I'm finding myself to be drawn directly to support the people of my community in contrast to an academic career not conducive to not fully supporting scholars of color. Following your presentation, I am inspiring to throw myself to my community and less burdened to pursue a 100% academic career. <laughs> So, so someone that might uh, have at least, if not chosen, just be scholar, at least thinking about scholar activism. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I love that. <laughs> um, I, uh, I learned so much um, in, in, in your presentation, Dr. Acosta, not only uh, about what you're doing about scholar activism, but about myself, too, because I'm always in awe of those who have had the courage to do things that I haven't. Uh, and, and some of these things that you have done are things that I haven't, even, even though I'm also tenured. Uh, but, you know, it, it gives me a little bit of, of hope that, you know, in, especially in these last years where I have been rethinking a lot about my role, that I can actually 
go back to those roots that I always had and, and, and start engaging much more in these kinds of, of projects. So personally, I thank you for that. Um, and, um, and, and, and I thank you for, for coming here, talking to all of us for an incredibly engaging uh, presentation for hopefully, you know, this wonderful piece that is going to come out that, that brings all of these emotional things, academic things, experiential things, activist things to a book that is not our cookie cutter thing that we academics are forced to do. So uh, if I can leave you with something is please do that. Uh, <laughs> in whichever form you want, it doesn't have to be all of it. Just if, if it's a small piece, I hope you do it because we need it. We, we really need it, I think. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I also want to close thanking everyone that participated today in this uh, uh, speaker, uh, wonderful uh, speaker series. Uh, thank you for coming here and listening to Dr. Costa asking important questions. Uh, muchas gracias a todos. Um, and I just want to leave the last words to you, Dr. Acosta. Me ha encantado mucho poder hablar con todos ustedes hoy. Muchas gracias por la oportunidad y que pasen un buen día.